As always, I'd like to take a moment before getting into this message to just say up front, um, I don't intend to hurt anyone today, all right? And I say that because I find out, brothers and sisters, that sometimes things are said that are virtually unbearable for some people. Uh, like I said on the radio this morning, y'all remember that, that, that scene in A Few Good Men? Uh, for those who saw that movie where, where uh, Jack Nicholson was uh, sitting on the, court, uh, on the stand in the courtroom and the man said, I want the truth. And Jack Nicholson said, you can't handle the truth. I found out a lot of our people can't handle the truth. They really can't. But I still got to give it. I still got to give it, you know. Uh, it's almost like surgery, you know. So if I say something that is a little bit outside of your realm of awareness, please exercise ex, uh, intellectual vigilance. And instead of shutting me down and instead of shutting your own mind down, make note of what I said that you don't understand and go do your research. Okay, go do your homework on it. Go verify what I said. If, if I'm saying something that you don't know anything about, how can you say anything about it? Right? Okay, so having said that, let's get into the message for today. As you see, the subject of today's message is Nicaea, 325 A.D. A.D. stands for Anno Domini. It does not stand for after the death of. Okay? Anno Domini is Latin, which means in the year of our Lord. What's really deep, brothers and sisters, is this, is, this really ought to tell you something. How the Gregorian calendar has been completely adjusted around the existence of someone that the Roman Catholic Church made up. That's some deep stuff. I mean, they, 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 they actually started counting time down up to a certain point, you know, BC, 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 or BCE before the Common Era. Then it comes to a certain point in history, and then they start counting up again. Okay? So here we have, this is 2006. Right? According to who? You mean tell me... We've only, we've only been here 2,006 years? No. Actually, I think this is 6,746. According to, if I'm correct on that, according to, and that's called after the founding of Kemet, AFK. So according to the ancient African calendar or the first stellar calendar, the, this year would be 6,746. Y'all follow what I'm saying? Okay. Now we got a problem with that. Okay. Because that's after the founding of Kemet. That's just the calendar found in Egypt. You follow what I'm saying? And those of you who are going with us to Kemet this year, you'll get at the Temple of Dendera, you'll get to see the first stellar in the observatory there. You'll get to see the first zodiac that was used. Okay. Which they copied all that from. Now some deep stuff because if we're talking uh, 6, 6736 or 6736 after the founding of Kemet and yet Kemet is the child of Ethiopia. Y'all following what I'm saying? Okay. And, and, and the, the civilization that came into Kemet came into Kemet with full knowledge of the math, of, the, of math and sciences and horticulture, out of agriculture. Y'all follow me? So how far back does African consciousness really go? If you do some research on, on what is called the um, Hutu and the Twa, you'll see that their history dates back almost 400,000 years. What, what number did I just say, y'all? Oh Almost 400,000 years of history of African people. Why don't they want us to know this? 
In order for those who have been misled to begin to see correctly, and you need to understand, y'all, a lot of us don't see correctly. We see what we've been given to see. We see through the lenses that were assigned to us. And in order for us to begin to see correctly, we must have a clear analytical understanding of the origin, the strategies, the mechanics, the purpose, and methods of the device that has blinded us in the first place. Now let's look back at that. First of all, have you identified the device that got you blind? Think with me. Have you identified it? Most of you have not. Most of you say, the white man. Okay. <laughs> and then how do you address that? You have to specifically identify the device that has miseducated you. Look at its origin. Go to the origin of it. Look at the strategy inculcated into it. What is the strategy behind your blindness? What's up with that? What is the mechanics of it? What is the purpose of it? Why have they purposed to miseducate you? Why? And then look at the methods that they have used to implement their design. And the number one method that's been used to implement this design upon our people is religion. Why is that? Why, why didn't they use economics to, 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 to attract us? Because we're not materialistic people. We're not capitalists by nature. Why did they use religion? Because by nature we are a spiritual people. By nature, we are attracted to things pertaining to God. So because we're attracted to things that's pertaining to God, they use things pertaining to God to, to, to snare us and hook us and, and place us under arrest and incarcerate our minds till we become dysfunctional and powerless. Brothers and sisters, when it comes to the liberation of the African mind from European concepts, whose concepts? European. Let me let me let me do something here. Do you honestly think that there is a need for the European mind to be delivered or liberated from European concepts? Let me hear your answer. What do you think about that? Yes. Or in case you are not clear, let me help you. Nothing is as backwards is to have an African brain with a European philosophy in it. Everybody knows who they are but us. Everybody on this planet. Everybody on this planet has cultural pride but us. Y'all follow what I'm saying? We must examine and then re-examine again and again and again those agencies that have Europeanized our thinking until we are truly disconnected from the tentacles of their grasp. Imagine a giant octopus, okay, and you're fighting just one of the tentacles. Just one of the tentacles, you're fighting it, and you got a hold on that one tentacle, and you think you're winning. Come on, man. When you got seven other tentacles that's wrapping you up and locking you up and making you immobile, you got to learn how to see the big picture here. The ecumenical councils were legally convened assemblies of ecclesiastical dignitaries. What kind of dignitaries did I just say? Yes. When I say ecclesiastical family, I mean church. Church dignitaries, okay? And theological, let me add this, so-called theological experts. 
For the purpose, it was convened for the purpose of discussing and regulating matters of church doctrine and discipline. Now, some deep stuff here because these council meetings actually created what's called authoritative decrees. I mean, they actually passed so-called laws as to what is and what is not, what you are allowed to think and what you better not say. Let's look at this, the Council of Nicaea. Three things I want to cover here today about that council. The cause of the council. Why was there a need to convene this council in the first place? Let's understand that. What was the decree that came out of the Council of Nicaea? And what was the outcome of the council itself? All right, let's, let's look closely at this. What caused the council meeting at Nicaea? Well, to understand that, we have to go back to the first European pharaoh in history. His name was Ptolemy the First Soter. I told you I was going to present some archaeological evidence. This is what this is this is what you mean. This is what I mean when I say evidence that demands a verdict. This is not somebody that we just made up. Here's a coin that dates back to this man's administration. The first European pharaoh. He was the beginning of what is called the Ptolemaic dynasties of ancient Egypt. I take that back. There's no such thing as an ancient white person. Did y'all hear what I said? They ain't been around long enough to refer to them as ancient. Okay, so if they are doing anything, it's recent. It's Johnny come late. Here you have this man, Ptolemy I, also known as Soter. Now, write down the word Soter, S-O-T-E-R. Write that down. You can see the years of his life, 367 to 283 BCE, approximately in then. Whenever you see C-A before dates, that means circa, means approximate. You write, did you write down S-O-T-E-R? Yes. Now, after that, write in parentheses, I mean like just make parentheses, but you're gonna continue the word. I O L O G Y. What does it spell? Soteriology. Exactly. Who knows what soteriology is? The doctrine or the study of salvation. Right. You know why? Because the word soter means savior. You need to understand the historicity here. This man, when he became Pharaoh in Egypt, he wanted the Egyptians to, to consecrate him as a god. Why? Not capital G-O-D, small G-O-D. Why was that? Because all of the pharaohs of Egypt, of Egypt were called gods. With a small G. That's why they said Asa Ra, a son of God. Every pharaoh was considered a god. Now, this European pharaoh comes in and he wants them to make him a god. But the Egyptians did not do that. The Egyptians said, no, you don't belong here in the first place. The only reason why you're on the throne is because you took, it was taken by military force under Alexander the Greek. Not Alexander the Great. Alexander the Greek. There was nothing great about him. Y'all following what I'm saying? Ptolemy the first, Soter, was a good friend of Alexander. And that's how he ended up becoming the first 
European pharaoh of Kemet. Check out his boldness. He took upon himself or himself the name Meriamun. Satepin Ra. Sound familiar? Ursa Ma'at Ra. Satepin Ra. Rametsu Meriamun. Mary means beloved or loved. Amen is God. So Mary Amen means beloved or loved of God. Setepin Ra means chosen by God. This, he wasn't given this name. He took it upon himself. Well, he insisted that they make an image in his honor. Oh, shucks now. The Egyptians didn't want to do that, so he started putting them to death. So he found a group of sellout Egyptians, Melkite, Coptic Egyptians, and the city of Manepha, which is known today as Memphis. The priest at Memphis, which was also the capital back then, the priest at Memphis said, we'll consecrate you to the priesthood. Why did they sell out? Right, we saved their behind. Exactly. Guess what? It still goes on today. So they sold out and they consecrated him to uh, the office of Pharaoh and they made an image. They made an image in honor of him and this image is called Serapis. Y'all following me? Y'all sure? So you got to understand this. You can't share this with nobody else if you don't understand it. The worship of Serapis. You see, this dude, Ptolemy the first, that is, that's Serapis, the Egyptian version of Serapis, dating back to approximately 350 BCE. This is the image that they made in honor of Ptolemy the first Soter. All right. Okay. What is Os Os Serapis? They took the name Osiris and combined it with the word Apis, which means the bull. All right. All right. Osiris. It became Serapis. Now here's the deep thing about it. Ptolemy the first tried to incorporate the religions, the religion of the Greeks into Egypt by creating the worship of a new God. And this was that God in honor of him called Serapis. Now, it was really a composite deity, as you see here. Again, as I said, made up, it looked kind of dumb, don't it? But hey, you know. The Egyptians had to give him something to appease him. Okay? And as you see here, over here is the Greco-Roman version of Serapis, the painting. How do you know that Serapis? By the cup on top of his head. Do y'all see it? Now, what year are we talking here? Greco-Roman, 135 BCE. So this can't be Jesus. If he had existed, it can't be Jesus. You follow what I'm saying? This is the image that the Greeks made the Africans worship. Yeah, buddy. Hmm. In fact, to show you how deep this goes, there was a correspondence from Emperor Hadrian referring to the Alexandrian worshipers. Where's Alexandria? Come on, talk to me. Where's Alexandria? In Egypt, Africa, right? Yes. The Alexandrian worshipers of Serapis calling themselves what? The bishops of Christ. Now that's deep. There was no Jesus. There was no Jesus. But yet these people refer to themselves as the bishops of Christ. And here's what he says. Egypt 
which you commended to me, my dearest Sir Servianus, I have found to be wholly fickle and inconsistent. Putting down Egypt, okay, I can deal with that. And continually wafted about by every breath of fame, the worshipers of Serapis here are called what? Wait a minute. The worshipers of Serapis are called Christians. And those who are devoted to the God, Serapis, I find, call themselves the bishops of Christ. Don't take my word for it, family. Go verify it. Just type this in right here on the internet. This whole thing will come up. Now, what does that mean? That means, brothers and sisters, that in Africa, this image of Serapis that goes all the way back to 350 BCE had become the object of worship. Y'all follow me? This was by command. Arius. Everybody say a brother called Arius. A brother called Arius. He had a problem with it. And he made some noise about it. They say this, and I wonder how true it is. The only thing necessary for falsehood or evil to triumph is for good men or women to remain silent. Follow what I'm saying? Falsehood was on the loose. A black man named Arius from Libya came forth and said, enough is enough. He began to explain to him, and you all see what years he lived here, 256 to 336 AD. So guess what? We're talking about the time of the Council of Nicaea, 325 AD. Right, right, right. Needless to say, you see, he died 11 years later. Okay? And I wonder, did he die or was he killed? Arius, yeah, buddy. Arius lived at a time when the church was divided because of the Christological dispute which he was instrumental in starting. He taught that, and everybody write this down, Christus, C-H-R-I, I'm sorry, C-H-R-I-S-T-U-S, -S, Christus. Christus was also the nickname for Serapis. What word do you see there? Christ. Christ, exactly. Not a Jesus, Serapis. And guess what, y'all? This was deep. This marble image right here, this is the newfangled version of Serapis. Okay, and they've used, they've used this bearded figure. This is now the image that they use for Jesus today. Okay, because Serapis... You know, or I do in a few minutes to show you the comparison. This marble bust of Serapis, which is in where? London. London Museum. Right now, as I'm talking to you, that's in the London Museum. Have, you were there, did you see it? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. This is in the London Museum. Why haven't we been, why haven't we been taught this? Why, y'all who grew up in the church all your life, why weren't you taught this? Why were not taught it? You can't teach it. Because it will cause the Christian church to shut down. Arius was making noise, man. He was telling everybody, this deity that y'all are worshiping, it's not deity. He was made by people's hands. Go back here. He, look at that. He was made, he was formed out of metal. How do you tell a people who have been worshiping Serapis for over two and a half centuries that what they've been worshiping ain't real? How do you do that? Arius was causing such a problem because people started listening to him. And they started doing their research and finding out the man was telling the truth. We're worshiping an image that was made in honor of Ptolemy the first. And the son of God, which, which this is called the son of 
God, same as with Jesus, the Europeans took the S-U-N, talk to me black people, and made it the S-O-N. Why do you think every picture you see of Jesus, the sun is behind his head? We weren't taught to, taught to call it, we, we were taught to call it a halo. I dare you to go down here to the Catholic Cathedral on Lindell, is it? All you got to do is walk in there and look, walk up to the altar and you see exactly what I'm talking about. They got this big pearly white Jesus on the cross with the sun behind his head, meaning he is a Sa-Ra, a son of Ra, and Ra was called, or God was called Ra in ancient Egypt. Are y'all following what I'm saying? Arius came along and he began to mess up everybody's program. He started telling people, y'all are believing in a statue. And guess what, y'all? Some of y'all do too. Some of y'all got the statue, little tiny one hanging around your neck. Yes, you do. And I mean, you know, I, I have to put it out again. Why do you keep celebrating that? Why do you keep celebrating death? You know, if you're going to celebrate something, celebrate life. Why is it that nobody yet, I should, I should patent this thing and make some money. Just, just so I can pay some bills. <laughs> I should patent this thing. I should actually patent and I'm giving somebody a secret to become a millionaire now. Okay, go out of here and patent and don't forget me when you do now, all right? Go out of here and patent an empty tomb. <laughs> Next Sunday, that's what everybody's supposed to be celebrating. The resurrection. Why ain't nobody wearing empty tombs around their neck? They're still wearing the cross with him on it. He's still dead. <laughs> Y'all follow what I'm saying, people? Arius caused such a problem for the, for the clergy coalition of his day. He caused such a problem for the minister's union of his day. He caused such a problem for the ecclesiastical dignitaries of his day that they, they had, I mean, really, people were starting to leave their churches and go into listen to Arius. So what happened, for the sake of stability in the Roman Empire, Constantine called a council and summoned all the bishops of the Roman Catholic Church to this council meeting. It was called the Nicene Council. And in this council, the first order of business was to discredit and silence Arius. Yes, we got to stop this man. Yes, black man from Libya. We got to stop him. He's telling the truth. But we don't need for the people to know that. Y'all hearing me? So they convened a council meeting and they came up with a creed. Now mind you, when this council meeting was called, there was no Jesus. This is who existed. Serapis. Y'all following what I'm saying? Are you clear? Don't take my word for it, invalidate what I'm saying. Prove me wrong. Come on now. Come on. Go find a coin or a statue of Jesus somewhere. <laughs> you won't find one, brothers and sisters. Nobody, origin, none of the historians of the first, second, third century said anything about somebody called Jesus. Right. Listen, bro. Listen, Lord, listen what I'm saying. Come on now. If there was somebody who really turned water into wine, 
They'd have statues of him everywhere, whom all things came to be, both those in heaven and those in earth. And for us humans and for our salvation, he came down and became incarnate, became human, suffered and rose up on the third day, went up into the heavens, and is coming to judge the living and the dead and in the Holy Spirit. Now, why did they have to say all this? <laughs> Think, people. If it really happened, you ain't got to go through all this. Now it gets real deep. Because now they, they in, the, in part two of this, they actually talk against Arius' words. And those who say, meaning Arius, there was once when he was not. See, that's what Arius said. Arius said, I remember the day when there was no Serapis image, when blacks were on the throne. Okay, Serapis didn't always exist. Serapis came into existence since you white folk got in here in Egypt. That's what he's saying. So the Roman Catholic Council said, and anybody who says that there was once when he was not, and before he was begotten, he was not, and that he came to be from things that were not, or from another hypostasis or substance, affirming that the Son of God is subject to change or alteration, these, the Catholic and Apostolic Church, what y'all, anathematizes. Look at the person that you say, there's that control mechanism again. They had to put this creed together because of what was happening with people's eyes coming open. Well, it's deep because there was a lot of confusion, a lot of discussion. People said, now that don't make no sense, but what Arius is saying does kind of make sense. So since they were going through all this, Emperor Constantine stepped into the room. And he said, all right, I'm ordering y'all to decree that the Serapis image is Jesus Christ. And that Jesus Christ is everything that was just said. And then he ordered all books to be burned. Why? You got to get rid of the evidence. See, y'all, that's why I encourage y'all, go to Kemet while you can. Go to Kemet while you can. Get the evidence while you can. Because in any argument of apologetics, that means proving your point, the rule is no evidence, no argument. Huh? Sure did. That's what the guy in Egypt said to us. Sure said it, brother. I forgot all about that. No evidence, no argument. And that's why they are whitewashing Kemet now. I should say Arab washing Kemet now. They're slowly but surely removing all of the black presence out of Egypt and replacing it with an Arab presence so that they can tell the world that they did all of this. When Constantine came in and made his ruling, all of the brothers who were behind Arius' dad, all of the brothers who stood with Arius, punked out. <laughs> Punk out, man. We don't, we, we, we don't, we don't want no trouble. <laughs> Arius, I know you're telling the truth, but man, shoot. We got to eat, man. I got to pay for that Lexus, man. You know, that chariot of gold that I'm riding out there, brother, and them horses, they're pulling that thing, man, it costs money. So, Arius, I'm sorry, brother, you know, you my man. You, can... <laughs> you know, you're here. But I, I, got to, I got to sidestep you on this one. Nobody stands up against the emperor, Constantine. And all the brothers who came to him, to, to, to Nicaea with him, forsook him. 
That's why y'all, you know, history tells me. You know, you got folk, I appreciate, I love it, I love it. When y'all say, I'm with you. Y'all know how much I done heard that? And folk who said it ain't here? I mean, I love to hear it, don't get me wrong. But I ain't resting on that. It's not your strength I'm standing on, man. I'm standing on the fact that God gave me this assignment. That's who my strength is. You follow what I'm saying? To awaken our people. I don't, I don't want to have to, I don't want, I don't want some of y'all who promise to be with me, man, when, 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 the, when the stuff hit the fan. You know, I look around and you ain't there because I'm going to shoot you if you ain't. <laughs> I say, man, I got out here because I thought y'all was with me. <laughs> don't take that serious, okay? I don't want nobody to get that out of I ain't going to shoot nobody. Unless I have to, that is. <laughs> yeah, buddy. Those who followed the brother abandoned him except two. And they were exiled under the order of Emperor Constantine. And as you saw, he died 11 years later. So, what was the outcome of the Nicene Council? A lie was put in place under a European pharaoh, a brother who was born a couple of centuries after the lie got put in place, rose up to speak the truth. And what did the powers that be do to the brother? Shut him down. Exiled him. And threatened him under the order of death to keep his mouth shut. All of the books that he wrote, all of the lectures that he had done, that's why I got my hard drive backed up many times over in many different places. Y'all hear what I'm saying? Okay? Got to do it, man. Too much work went into all this research. You know, they, the or order was to burn all of his literature. Burn it. Get rid of it. You know? So the outcome of the Council of Nicaea was the transformation of Serapis Christus, which means Christ the Savior. Y'all see it? Serapis, Soter, Christ the Savior became Jesus Christ by Edict of Emperor Constantine in 325 AD. And I just wanted to put that up there because see y'all gonna be looking at that all this week. Because this is the passion week. This is the week that they used to get this stuff into us and God is walking around. The Romanized fabricated figure known as Jesus Christ became a fictionalized Soter, savior of the world. And just as I close now, and, and just as with Brother Arius, anyone, who did I say? Anyone who tries to reveal the truth about the lie that Rome has perpetrated upon the world, especially Africans, they become the victims of severe anathematization. So, understand that, brothers and sisters. Officers, understand that. Young people, young brother, like the question we ask, understand what lies ahead, man. African family, liberators, revolutionaries, understand what lies ahead. Walk together, children. Don't you ever get weary. 
walk together, pray together, sing together, shout together. Don't ever get weary. Hold up your head because the ancestors, good God Almighty, got a great camp meeting going on in the promised land. The ancestors are excited, Brady, because we, their great, great, great grandchildren are taking up the mantle of their life, their deeds, their legacy, their contribution, and saying we're going to do like Brother Arius and cry out against this deception that keeps the minds of our people under arrest. Y'all hear what I'm saying? We sing in the song, they'll be coming from the north, south, east, and west. Good Lord have mercy to stand by our side. So don't be afraid. You know, I, there's a biblical story about a young man and his mentor going to war. And all the armies of the enemy were all around the hilltops and the mountains. And the young brother who didn't have much experience in spiritual warfare got scared and said to his teacher, we're going to die, we're going to die, we're going to die. And Elijah, in the text, who had much more experience in spiritual warfare, said, God help this young man. Open his eyes. And help him to understand that they that be with us are more than those who are against us. Brothers and sisters, there ain't enough, there ain't enough opposition out here to outnumber our ancestors. Y'all hear what I'm saying? ancestors. That's why we say it every time we come together. Oh ancestors, stand with us. Protect us and guide us and teach us. Protect us from the snare of our enemies. Rise up, oh African ancestors, and let our enemies be scattered. Then we say, and give us the wisdom and the boldness to deal with our oppressors and those who would hinder the liberation and empowerment of our people. Rise up, O oh African ancestors, and live in us. Ooh, buddy. Ah, and if you do that, we will not fail to honor you. We will not fail to respect you. We will not fail to hear you. And we will not sell out and betray you. Ashe. It is.